week, we're going to be moving up. Possibly even later that day, we'll be moving up. Okay? Most people find this stuff easier than stuff we've done until now. The hardest part from here on out is algebra. We're going to be doing a lot of algebra. It's simple algebra, though. It's this divided by x equals this number, solve for x. It's that kind of algebra. If you're good at that, you're going to do well from here on forward. If you struggle with that, that is something you want to work on. Because a lot of the things we're going to do from here on out, we have, you're going to have different equations. You're going to figure out which variables you have, plug those in, and solve for the one that you don't. We're going to have different forms of that. So today, we're going to start talking about energy, and then we're going to get into gases. So we already said that all changes, physical and chemical changes, have an energy change that goes with them. I mean, remember, we had endothermic and exothermic reactions. Wood burning is exothermic. Ammonium nitrate in a cold pack, when it dissolves in water, gets cold that endothermic. Okay? So we're going to talk more bigger picture about energy for a bit. We're going to, not in the context of reactions, but big picture, more physics type, type energy. So we have different forms of energy. One is kinetic energy. That is the energy of movement. Something moves because it has kinetic energy. If you put kinetic energy into something, you make it move. Anything that's moving has kinetic energy. Molecules fly around. So think of a gas where the molecules are flying around freely. When you heat a sample of gas, the molecules start to fly around faster. And we'll talk more about that in the second section today. But when you heat molecules, they move faster. If they move faster, they must have more kinetic energy. So essentially, temperature is a measure of kinetic energy of atoms. If you put your thermometer in a sample, really what you're measuring is how much kinetic energy those molecules have. Now granted, we've taken that and turned it into something that makes sense in real life, the temperature and how hot something feels. But when you get right down to it, what you're measuring is how fast the molecules are moving. We also have potential energy. Potential energy is energy that something has based on where it is. So if I take this marker and I drop it, it's going to start moving, right? When I drop it, it now has kinetic energy. But that kinetic energy doesn't just come out of thin air. It comes from somewhere. When I hold the marker here, it has potential energy because it has the potential to move if I drop it. So when I drop it, the potential energy gets converted to kinetic energy. And then when I pick it back up, my, my muscles and things are burning glucose and things, making energy, and I'm putting that energy into the marker in the form of potential energy. And then when I release it, it turns into kinetic energy. The chemical energy energy that are in chemicals that gets released in a reaction, the energy gets re that gets released when you burn something, is a form of potential energy. Yeah. So if you were like throwing a baseball, mm -hmm. and you threw the baseball, so while you're holding it, it's potential energy. But once you, once you throw it... Well, you have to be throwing sideways. There's no potential energy. Potential energy is due to gravity. Oh. So if, you're, if I'm holding a baseball and I drop the baseball, then the potential energy gets converted to kinetic energy. But if I throw it sideways, I am just simply putting kinetic energy into it by my arm. So the potential energy doesn't kind of change. Like transferring energy, right? Yeah. You're transferring it from my arm into the ball. Correct, because if I take two markers and I hold 
one higher, and I drop them both, which one's moving faster when it hits the ground? The one higher. The one that was higher. So, once it all got converted into kinetic energy, it was moving faster. Yeah, so this type of stuff, every hard science likes to claim as their own. And so this, I mean, people have probably done this in physics and engineering and things like that. Today, we're going to call it chemistry. So looking at these two pictures, and going based off what we have all learned based on cartoons our entire life and how to interpret them, which of these two would you say has more kinetic energy? A. Why A? It appears it's going faster because the little shadow is longer. Okay? We all know what that means. And that is, that means what we think it means. That one is moving faster than these, and so this one must have more kinetic energy. So we're going to talk about heat, we're going to come back to our heat, but we're going to now have units and numbers to go with our heat. So if you look at a nutrition label, we have calories. Top, top thing, probably the most important thing on there is calories. Calories are a measurement of energy or a measurement of heat. Heat is a type of energy. Heat is energy that gets transferred between two things from the hot thing to the cold thing. If you have two things that are different temperatures, heat will go from the hot thing to the cold thing. That is something you know that should not be a mind-blowing revelation. Heat goes from hot things to cold things. We're going to talk about heat and energy in two different units, joules and calories. There are other units. We're going to use joules and calories. One calorie is 4.184 joules. It's got to be on. Yes, that, that, that's on here. So you don't have to memorize that. But you'll do it enough times, you'll probably have it stuck in your head. So one calorie is 4.184 joules. That is our conversion factor to go between them. Where you want to hit somebody is when you realize the difference between a calorie with a capital C and a calorie with a lowercase c. Calorie with a capital C is a thousand calories with a little c. Calorie with a big C is a kilocalorie. Don't blame this on scientists. Scientists that a calorie with a little c, that's our conversion. And then someone, probably with an MD, because MDs always think they make the rules, even though they don't make any sense, said, I'm going to make my own calorie. I'm going to come up with a calorie with a big C. Because science doesn't matter, and we're just going to live in the real world. Yeah, with basic nutrition, I think it was like more manageable instead of saying I had to ingest like right. two hundred thousand calories. Right. But come up with your own unit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you go outside of the U.S., even, even Canada, sometimes instead of calorie with a big C, it'll say kilocalorie. I don't know. But you have to remember. Calorie with a capital C is a thousand of the little calories. A lot of times I'll just call them big calories and little calories. So one big calorie equals a thousand little calories, which is a one kilocalorie. This kilocalorie you're not going to see in problems or anything, but it may help you to remember this that it's a thousand because it's a kilo calorie, like a kilogram is a thousand grams, yeah. And that's not in the PC? The kilocalorie is in here. No. The big, the big calorie, the little calorie is not.
So this thing, whatever it is, the ingredients are organic whole grain wheat, organic evaporated cane juice, and natural flavor. I never understand that, because it seems like it's probably an organic hippie cereal, but then they throw in natural <laughs> flavors, which would seem like something... Well, natural. Yeah. you think they would want to know what these natural flavors yeah. are. So I'm guessing this is some sort of cereal, and one serving is 190 calories. So we need to figure out what is the energy content of one serving in joules. So we need to convert 190 calories to joules. We're going to do dimensional analysis. So we're starting with 190 calories. Can we go straight from 190 calories to joules? No, why not? Because it says 4.184 joules is one calorie. Because it's a small C. Because that's a small C. We're starting with a big C. So we need to go one big calorie equals a thousand little calories. I canceled my units. I've now gone to little calories. Now I can do the 4.184. Now you go from little calories to joules? Correct. So little calories, little calories to joules. One little calorie is 4.184 joules. It's the same type of conversion you've been doing. We just now have a, a couple extra conversion factors. When you do that, it comes out to be 7.9 times 10 to the fifth joules. And that is why, on a nutrition label, in the real world, we use these big calories. Because one bowl of cereal without the milk has 790,000 joules. That's a big number. And so over the course of a day, you take in a whole lot of joules. It's not very convenient to work in joules, so we work in the big calories. So we're going to take what those units, your question? How many, how many places you the <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to take these units. We're going to apply them to a concept that we call specific heat. Specific heat is how much energy it takes to change the temperature of something. You probably noticed some things heat up a whole lot easier <coughs> than other things. Think about water and metal. Which one do you, would you expect to heat up faster water. if you put it out in the sun? Water. Metal. Metal. Oh, because the Metal, is, imagine going out there and putting your hand on a car, yeah. a hot car in the Florida sun versus a pool. Yeah. The car is going to heat up a whole lot faster. So you know when you put heat into something, the temperature goes up. The specific heat is a measurement of how much heat is required to raise the temperature of one gram, one degree Celsius. So it's a base, it's a kind of a, a base factor. So we say, well, if I have this much of this substance and I really want to raise the temperature 10 degrees, how much heat do I need? This is called the specific heat. And the units are joules per gram degree Celsius or calories per gram degree Celsius. Water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Do you have to memorize that? No. So anytime you need a specific heat, you'll be given it. But this is where the conversion one calorie equals 4.184 joules is. Somebody figured out how many joules, before calories even existed, they figured out how many joules does it take to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. And it was 4.184. So they said, I'm going to call that one calorie. So it takes one little calorie to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. 
is what that means. So we can calculate how much heat is going to be required to raise the temperature of a sample. This is an equation that is not on the cheat sheet. This is one you're going to have to have memorized for quizzes, for exams, for the final exam. Okay? It's heat equals mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature. We put that in the symbols. We have what we call delta H equals MC delta T. This delta, this triangle, means change. So the change in heat equals mass times the specific heat, which we abbreviate with a C, times the change in temperature. To me, it looks like M cap. Delta H equals M cap. What one way or another, you're going to have to remember that equation. So type of question that you would use this equation for is written below that. So it says we have a sample of water. It's 15 grams. We want to increase its temperature from 25 Celsius to 75 Celsius. So we're going to plug these variables in, and we're going to solve for our unknown. First thing you have to do is figure out which of these four variables are we trying to solve for. So in this question, which of the four variables are we trying to solve for? Say it again. Heat. We're trying to solve for the heat. So delta H is our unknown, which means we have to have the other three. If we don't have the other three, there's no way to solve for delta H. So what is M? What is our mass? 15.0 grams. C is specific heat. We just, it was on the last slide, so it's not specifically given to you, but it is 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. On an exam, something I, I would give that to you. So that is C. Now we need delta T. What is the change in our temperature of our sample? 50. We're going from 25 up to 75. Temperature is going up, so delta T is going to be a positive number. It can be a negative number. If temperature goes down, delta T will be negative. But we're going up 50, from 25 to 75. So this is 50 degrees Celsius. We have our three variables. We can just plug them in. So delta H equals 15.0 times 4.184 times 50. Uh, that comes out to be 3,140 <coughs> joules. That's that, probably first thing to get, right? Yeah, because I got 3138. Yes, because there are three six six. Pretty straightforward. Huh? Yes, that's a J. Okay. J for jewels. It depends on what the sample is made out of. But it, whatever it is, you'll be given C. You'll either be given C, or you'll be given delta H, and you'll you just have to solve for C. I'm guessing there's one coming. If not, we can do one. So the next one. What if the heat change when 15 grams of water cools from 75 to 25? So again, we're looking for delta H. Is my M the same? Yes. yes. Is my C, my specific heat, the same? Yes. yes, it's still water, and so C is the same. Is my delta T the same? No. No, why not? Negative. It's negative. We went down 50. So delta T is now negative 50. So I need to put a negative in here, which makes my answer negative. When something has a temperature that goes up, heat goes into it. So delta H is positive. It is absorbing heat. When something cools down, it is losing heat. 
and we say it's a losing heat by putting a negative on the number. Negative 3,140 joules means the sample lost <coughs> 3,140 joules. If something, it takes the same amount of energy to go up a certain number of degrees if it, as is released when it comes down the same amount. So we ended up at 25, which is right where we started. So we put 3,140 in, and then when it cooled back down, we got the same exact amount out. We are not going to create energy. We're not going to destroy energy. If we end up where we started, energy overall doesn't change. We go right back to zero. So here's another one. In this case, which variable are we trying to solve for? Which one? It's heat again. So how much heat is transferred? So delta H is unknown. So what is mass? 156 grams. What is C? So it's given to us, it's 0 0.895. And so then we must have delta T. What is our delta T? So that one you might be able to do in your head. It's not easy to do in your head. And so let's, let's do it. So delta T is always final minus initial, where you end up minus where you started. And so we have 75 minus 25.5, which is 49.5 degrees Celsius. It's positive, <coughs> meaning our temperature, oop, I did that backwards. We're cooling. We're cooling from 75 to 25.5. 25.5 is the initial. Minus 75 is going to give us negative 49.5. So that still can, well, the initial and the final is still. Right. So we finished at 25.5. We started at 75. And so we went down 49.5 degrees. So we have our variables. We can plug them in. <coughs> Equals 156, 0 0.895 times negative 49.5. Equals This equation here is the same equation. Some places use a Q instead of a delta H. If you go online, you should start looking for example problems online, you watch YouTube videos, it's very well possible that they're going to use a Q instead of a delta H. Q and delta H mean the same exact thing. They're interchangeable. To me, delta H is a little more descriptive. Delta means change, H means heat. Q does not immediately mean heat, right? That's something you'd have to memorize. So, the question, what is the sign, what is the sign of Q, positive or negative? negative? Negative. So what does that mean about the heat in our sample? Say it again. We lost heat, yes. Which makes sense, because we cooled down. You can check yourself. Use logic. It cooled down, we must have lost heat. Is my answer negative? If my answer is not negative, it's positive, then something is not right. Then you can go back and figure it out. Is that supposed to be negative? Because it cooled. Oh, because, oh, because it cooled, it's, it's negative. <coughs> Thank you.
So this is designed to see if you really understand what specific heat is and what it really tells us. So we have three samples, aluminum, copper, and lead, and they all weigh 50 grams. We're going to add one kilojoule of heat into each one. So they all weigh the same amount, and they all get the same amount of heat. The question says, which would increase in temperature by the greatest amount? Let's look at our equation. So delta H is the same in all of them. So we can ignore that. M is the same in all of them. So we can ignore that. If we were to plug those in, and we needed to solve for delta T, delta T is going to be determined by C. So mathematically, if I want the largest delta T, the largest increase in temperature, is that going to be the smallest C that's going to give me that, or the largest C? Smallest. Smallest. So if we solve this equation for delta T, we get delta H over M times C. A big C leads to a little delta T. They go in opposite directions because that is on the bottom over here. And so the smallest C will give you the largest delta T. And logically, it makes sense. I said specific heat is how much heat is required to get a temperature change. It's like a price tag. The lower specific heat means you get more temperature change for your money. Money being the heat. If you put in the same amount of heat, you get more temperature change for it. And so lead has the smallest specific heat. So it's going to give you the largest temperature change. If you see a problem like this on a quiz or an exam, the easiest, quickest way to do it is a logic, like we just did. But there is nothing stopping you from plugging in M delta H and the C from each one and calculating delta T for all three and just figuring out which one was the largest. If you want to put in the math, and that's, that's the way you're comfortable doing it, do it. You will get the right answer. The logic is just a shortcut. If you're not comfortable with the shortcut, do the work. So the smallest amount gives you the largest temperature change? Yes. Okay. Small specific heat mean large temperature change. So before we go on the gases, I want to come back to your question for an example. Okay. So the type of question that you might see, all of the ones that we did here, you were solving for delta H. But it's possible that you may have to solve for C. So let's say we have a sample, we don't know what it is. Okay. If we don't know what it is, we don't know what the specific heat is. If I put 500 joules into it, and I know my sample is 10 grams, and I measure the temperature, and I see that it, go that it goes up 50 degrees. We now have delta H, M, and delta T. We can solve for C. And so what that ends up looking like is 500 <coughs> equals 10 times C times 50. And you need to solve for C. And there are a number of different algebra techniques you can use to solve for C. Some people like to do cross multiplying. Other people like to move things around. I'm one of the types of people that likes to move things. And so what I would do is I would move 
these two over, when they move sides, they flip top to bottom. So over here, they're multiplying, so you end up with 500 divided by 10 times 50 equals C. And so that's 500 divided by 500, and C comes out to 1. And so these problems, they're no more difficult than when we're solving for delta H. You're given three of the four variables, and you solve for the fourth. In this case, we had to do the algebra to solve for C. If you are uncomfortable solving for C with numbers, you can always solve for C before you plug in the numbers. So you would get delta H divided by M times delta T. So in this equation, it's that the little C or the big C? Or is there something else? This is neither. This is C for specific heat. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why they picked the C. I don't know. It's just a coincidence. So that is our specific heat energy part of our lecture. Does that make sense? You've got one equation. You have to memorize it. But you will always, always, always be given three of the four variables. Solve for the fourth. That's what you got to do. Okay, then we're gonna move on to gases. There was a video today. If you didn't watch it, you'll be okay. We, we're, we're okay to just move on the slide without it, but I would suggest watching it, okay? There's some conceptual stuff in there that may help you down the road. It's not something that's gonna be required, but it may help you understand what's going on. We're going to talk about gases. Gases change a lot. Next week we'll talk about solids and liquids. Solids and liquids are boring compared to gases. Gases can do a whole lot. And it's because the molecules are flying around independently. They can change volume. They can change pressure. I mean, we don't measure the pressure of a table, right? We measure air pressure, though. So in the video, they talk about what creates pressure. Pressure is created by the, by the gas molecules in your container hitting the walls of the container. And so imagine you have a balloon. You have air molecules in that balloon. They're hitting the sides of the balloon. And when they hit the sides of the balloon, they punch it out a little bit. One little molecule is not very strong. It's not going to move that balloon wall. But think about how many molecules there are in a mole. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So in a balloon, there are a lot of molecules. And they're all punching out on the balloon at the same time. And so together, they create enough force to expand the balloon. So looking at these two pictures, which one do you think has the most pressure? The most, one with the most pressure would be the one with the most force pushing out on that wall. Why B? Because there are more molecules. If we look at the universal speed markings, they're both moving the same speed in A and B. But B has more. So at any given point in time, there are more atoms hitting the wall. And if there are more atoms hitting the wall, there's more force being applied to that wall. And so a balloon that has more air in it has greater pressure. Big surprise, right? You blow on a balloon, you're putting air into it. You increase the pressure, it makes the balloon expand. What if you had two samples? And they both had five atoms in them. But they're moving different speeds. Which one would have with the more pressure? The faster one. Why the faster one? It has more kinetic energy. So what happens when it hits the wall? It's moving, it's moving faster, so it hits it harder. 
the number of atoms determines how often they hit the wall. The temperature determines how hard they hit the wall. So if you have two samples with the same number of atoms, the one that's hotter will hit the wall harder. And so you'll get more pressure. You heat a balloon, it expands. That's probably not a surprise to you either. So you said the number of atoms determined, what do you mean? The pressure. Okay. We'll come back to more of that. We'll actually have an equation to deal with that, though. Okay. So pressure has units. There are a whole bunch of pressure units. Luckily, we're only going to use two or three of them. Okay. In America, we use PSI, pounds per square inch. Does any, anybody scuba dive? I saw my tires. True, that's probably more a common thing, isn't it? <laughs> tires are PSI, <laughs> pounds per square inch. That measures the pressure in your tires. Written out, that is pounds per square inch. That's how much force there is pushing on one square inch of tire on the inside. Atmospheric pressure, if you go on weather.com and you look at the barometric pressure, it's going to give you inches of mercury. And on the surface, inches of mercury makes no sense at all. How is inches of mercury a measurement of pressure? The original barometer was a glass dish filled with mercury. Mercury is a liquid, right? The more the atmospheric pressure, the more force there is pushing down on this mercury. When you push down on the mercury, it forces it up this tube. It's just like a thermometer. And you read it the same way. And so inches of mercury is literally how many inches up the tube the mercury goes. So that's where that unit came from. We don't use inches of mercury, though, because we don't use inches. We use millimeters of mercury. It's the same idea, it's just measured in millimeters instead of inches. We also use TOR. Luckily, a TOR is the same exact thing as a millimeter of mercury. One millimeter of mercury equals one TOR. You can go back and forth between millimeters and TOR however you want to. You can alternate between them if you want. They are the same thing. We also use ATMs which are atmospheres. This is kind of a real world unit because the atmosphere, on average, is one atmosphere of pressure. That's where that one atmosphere comes from. A tor is a smaller unit, so it's better for measuring things in science, but it's a kind of a, a, it's not a convenient number to use in real life. One atmosphere equals 700 in 60 tor. That is on here. You don't have to memorize that, but that is another one of those conversions you're going to use over and over and over again, and so you're probably going to remember it anyways. One atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury, but because that is the same as a tor, one atmosphere also equals 760 tor. Another somewhat common unit although you will never see it on a quiz or an exam, are pascals. Pascals are sometimes used in science, but we won't be using them. Pascals are very, very tiny units. So there are a number of factors, things that we can use to describe a sample of gas that will change. We've talked about pressure. We've talked about the volume of a balloon also. So that, that's two things. We have pressure of gases, we have volume of gases, we have temperature, and we also have the amount of gas that's in our container. Those are four things. We have volume. We'll measure volume in liters or milliliters. We have pressure. For the most part, we'll be using atmospheres, although you can also use TOR. We'll use both of them. We'll talk about temperature. Temperature has to be in Kelvin. If you're dealing with gases, temperature has to be in Kelvin. If you use Celsius, you will be wrong. 
and a fair number of you will use Celsius at some point in the semester. If you're dealing with gases, it has to be Kelvin. And then we have amount of particles, which we're going to measure in moles. So particles being atoms or molecules of our gas. <coughs> Are we still going to use that part of the value of the No. So finally, this last little point here is saying we're going to put, have some equations. And these equations refer to what we call an ideal gas. Ideal gas follows these equations perfectly. In the real world, an ideal gas doesn't exist. But in normal conditions, like here in, in, in our lab, Real gases are so close to this mythical ideal gas that we can't tell the difference. We'll talk about what causes where you do see a difference between a real and ideal later on, but in our experiments, we're going to assume everything is an ideal gas. Okay. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to go through a number of principles, talking about how these different factors are related. And there's going to be equations for each one. But I'm going to just breeze past those equations, because at the end, we're going to have one big equation that you can use for all of the problems. Okay? So the first relationship we're going to talk about is volume and pressure. Now think about your tires or your balloon. If you increase the pressure in your tires way above what you're supposed to be, what's going to happen to the volume of your tires? Increase. They're going to blow up, right? If you increase the pressure in a balloon, the balloon blows up. As pressure goes up, volume goes up. The problem is, that is on the inside of our balloon. Imagine we have a balloon that we take, it's, it's, say it's this big, and I put it into a pressure chamber. It's very high pressure. What's going to happen to the volume of that balloon? It's going to shrink. What happens if you release a balloon, it has helium in it, and it goes up in the atmosphere? What happens, do you know what happens to the size of that balloon? It expands until it blows up, so it explodes. Atmospheric pressure gets lower as you go up. And so you need to, what you can think about it as, is the force pushing in on the balloon. So in the equations that we're going to be dealing with pressure here, it is the pressure on the outside. It's the pressure pushing in on the balloon. A high pressure pushes in hard, so it shrinks the balloon. If you have a low pressure, you don't have much force pushing in, and so the air in the balloon forces the walls out, and the balloon expands. And so what we have is an inverse relationship between our pressure and our volume, because our pressure is the outside pressure. As pressure goes up, volume goes down. If we pick a couple points here, we start here, at point 0.4 pressure, we have 14 liters of volume. If we double that pressure, from 0.4 to 0.8, we have 7 liters of volume. They moved by the same factor. Pressure doubled, volume halved. Pressure went up by a factor of 2, volume went down by a factor of 2. It's a linear relationship. If pressure goes up by 5, volume will go down by a factor of 5. If pressure goes down by a factor of 3, volume will go up by a factor of 3. Another way we can look at these gases, not in a balloon, but it's in this piston system. So we have this cylinder with a sample of gas, and then there's a piston. Imagine this like a syringe where you put your finger over the end, and then you push on it. What happens if you cap the end of the syringe and you push on the plunger? What happens as the plunger goes in? <coughs> Say it again? 
more pressure. It gets harder to push, right? You get to the point that you, even though it's not all the way down, you can't push it any further. So here we have our system, and there's a gas. We push down on the plunger. These molecules, these atoms, get compressed. And so now there's more atoms in, in, in less space, and so we have increased pressure. As volume went down, you went from that much volume to that much volume, pressure went up. They went in the opposite direction. If you have a syringe and you try to pull the plunger out, what happens? You get resistance. You get resistance. Yeah. The pressure gets so low that it's like a vacuum. <coughs> and it starts pulling it back in. And so as the volume gets larger, as you pull the plunger out, pressure goes down. Pressure and volume go in opposite directions. So this is what we call Boyle's Law. This is one of these equations I said I'm going to throw up here, but I'm not going to spend much time on. Essentially what this tells us is that pressure, P, is proportional to, that's what this symbol means, the inverse of volume, which is the math way of saying they go in opposite directions, but with equal magnitude. If one doubles, the other one halves. And so you do some math magic. And what you get is this equation, P1, V1 equals P2, V2. These gas law problems are going to have these subscripts 1 and 2. They're always going to be dealing with a change. The 1s are before the change. The 2s are after the change. So we'll come back to this. But essentially, this is another equation. The problem would give you three of four variables. You would solve for the fourth. Plug and go. I've rearranged them here. You will not have that on the cheat sheet. This is on the cheat sheet, but when we get to the end, I'm going to tell, show you an e what I think is an easier way. You don't even have to use that. Oh. So this is Boyle's law in real world, in real life. If you Take a bag of potato chips. In this case, it's a bag of lightly salted potato chips. And we go up in elevation. You drive up a mountain. The bag gets puffier. Why? Less atmospheric pressure. Less atmospheric pressure. So at sea level, you have air in the bag pushing out. You have air outside the bag pushing in. in this is where it sits. As you go up the mountain, the air inside the bag keeps pushing with the same amount, but the atmospheric pressure drops. If you go up the mountain, pressure drops, and so the bag expands. Why is it important that they're lightly salted potato chips? Is it important? No. So as much as you complain about my questions being tricky, be glad I'm not the type of professor that throws in all kinds of unneeded information. Because there are professors that do that. They throw in all kinds of stuff trying to get you as confused as possible. I try not to do that. So we're going to move on to temperature and volume. Based on your experience, what is the relationship between temperature and volume of a gas? Yeah. If you heat a balloon, the volume goes up. So here's a balloon. This is what it looks like at room temperature. If you pour liquid nitrogen, which is very, very cold, onto it, it shrinks. If you heat the balloon, it will get bigger. So as temperature increases, volume increases. So we said volume and pressure go in opposite directions. Temperature and volume go in the same direction. Temperature goes up, volume goes up. Temperature goes down, volume goes down. This is Charles' law. Any Brooklyn Nine-Nine fans in here? No? It's, it's, 
TV show. Well, one of the characters is Charles Boyle. And there's Boyle's Law and Charles Law. I don't know if the writer was a nerd or if it's a con or it's just a coincidence. But this is Charles Law. Volume and temperature go in the same direction. Volume is proportional to temperature. We do our math magic and we get this equation. But again, you're not going to have to worry about that. What you have to remember, because we're dealing with temperature, is it has to be in Kelvin. And that's because the conversion between Kelvin and Celsius is an addition-subtraction conversion. If you do addition-subtraction here, it's going to mess up the ratio. Mathematically, if you can convert one thing, one unit to another by multiplying or dividing, and you do it to both of them, say both volumes, you go from liters to milliliters, that's dividing by a thousand. That's not going to change your ratio. If you add and subtract, it does. So, if you're dealing with gases, temperature has to be in Kelvin. Again, I rearrange them for you if you want them. This is another no-brainer one. What's the relationship between the amount of gas, the amount of air in your balloon, and the volume of your balloon? More air, more volume. As volume goes up, sorry, as amount of gas goes up, volume goes up. In your gas law, the amount of gas is, sim is used a symbol N. Number of moles is what that means. So say that again, amount of gas. <coughs> say that. As, as the amount of gas goes up, okay. the volume goes up. Okay. As you blow into the balloon, you're adding more gas, the volume of the balloon goes up. So again, we have yet another equation. This is Avogadro's law. Avogadro's law is that the number of moles of gas in the volume go in the same direction. As you add more gas, volume goes up. With this Avogadro's law, we're going to introduce another concept. It's called standard temperature and pressure, or STP. We're going to use STP in some problems. We're going to start with a sample of gas at these conditions, this temperature, this volume, this pressure. And we're going to change it to STP. So standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. But notice this is Celsius. You can never use Celsius with gases. So standard temperature is negative 273.15 Kelvin once you convert it. That is on your cheat sheet. Standard temperature is on here. It's given both in Celsius and Kelvin. So you don't have to memorize this. Standard pressure is one atmosphere. That is also on here. So you don't need to memorize the numbers for STP, but you have to remember what STP is. It is a kind of a home base so that you can compare all samples to each other. And Avogadro figured out that if we have one mole of gas, any gas, doesn't matter whether it's methane or water or benzene or carbon dioxide, if we have <coughs> one mole of it and it is at zero Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure, it will be 22.4 liters. That's a lot. 22.4 liters is a lot. Imagine 12 2 liters. That's basically what we're dealing with with 22.4. That's one mole. 18 grams, 18 milliliters of water at STP as a gas would take up 22 liters. As, as you turn into a gas, the molecules get really far apart. And this number is for any gas. Any gas at STP will have a volume of 22.4 liters. So this is the equation you do need to know. What this takes is all of the other three 
and combines them into one. And you will always be able to use this one and ignore the other ones. Okay? This is the combined gas law. It is literally just the other equation mathematically combined together. All of them? All of them. We'll, we'll see. Essentially, you're going to look at the problem you're dealing with, and if there's a variable up here that's not part of the problem, you're just going to erase it. If pressure is not in there, you write this equation and you erase the piece. If temperature is not in there, you erase the temperatures. You just leave whatever variables are part of your problem and go with it. So here's our example. So we're going to use our combined gas law to solve a Boyle's Law problem. So traditionally, you would have to figure out this is the equation you had to use. But we're not going to remember all the individual ones. We're going to start with our combined gas law. P1, V1 over N1, T1 equals P2, V2 over N2, T2. So we're going to look at this problem, and we're going to figure out of these four variables, P, V, N, and T, which are part of this problem. Is pressure part of this problem? Yes. The pressure is decreased from 1.2 to 0.25. So pressure is definitely part of this problem. Is volume part of this problem? Yes. Our volume is changing. Volume is what we're trying to find. Is number of moles part of this problem? No. no. Nowhere in there are we talking about the number of moles. So I'm going to erase my end. Is temperature part of that problem? No. no. There's no mention of temperature any, anywhere in there. It actually, it says constant temperature. So if temperature is not changing, you erase it. We erase our T's, and what do we have left? that equation. We remembered one equation, we erased what we didn't need, and you'll always be left with the right equation. So now we have four variables left, P1, V1, P2, V2. Remember the ones are the starting conditions, the twos are the final conditions. Looking at that problem, which of these four variables is the one we're trying to solve for? It's volume. Is it V1 or V2? Two. two. So what is the new volume? So that's V2. The V2 is our unknown, which means we have to have the other three. So what is P1? That's the, the starting pressure. 1.2 atmospheres. It says we decrease from 1.2 to 0.25. So we're going from 1.2 to 2.5, whoops, sorry, 0.25. So P1, starting pressure, is 1.2 atmospheres. What is my final pressure? 0 0.25 atmospheres. For pressure, with the units, you can use either atmospheres millimeters of mercury or tor, as long as both pressures are in the same unit. In this case, they're both atmospheres, so we, we just leave them. If one was in atmospheres and one was in tor, we'd have to convert one of them to the other one. And it wouldn't matter which way you went. In this case, they're both in atmospheres, so we're going to leave them. So we're missing V1. What is V1? Two, Two liters. We're starting at 2.0 liters. So we have three of the four, we can plug them in. So we get 1.2 times 2.0 equals 0 0.25 times V2. If you solve for V2, you get 1.2 times 2 divided by 0 0.25 equals V2, sorry, what is it? 9.6. Equals 
You have to figure the unit is. The unit for what you get out will be the unit that you put in for V V1. We put in liters, and so we get out liters. If we would have put in milliliters, we would have gotten out milliliters. That is a gas law problem. This is one that involved pressure and volume. We can do the same thing with Charles' law. So I'm going to erase this. Everybody got it? Yep. <clears throat> and I'm going to go back to my complete equation. The combined gas law is in here also. So that's my complete equation. That is our problem. Looking at the problem, is pressure involved in the problem? No. no, it says at constant pressure. Pressure is not changing, so I'm going to erase my pressure. Is volume involved in the problem? Yes. So I'm going to leave my volume. Is number of moles involved? No. So I'm going to erase my ends. What about temperature? Yes. yes. So we've got V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. That is our equation for this problem. So we must have three of the four. Of the four, which is the one we're trying to solve for? Temperature 2 the new temperature. T2 is our unknown, which means we must have V1. What is V1? One, 150. It says our gas is 150 milliliters, and it is cooled until it is 100. So it's starting at 150 milliliters. V2 is 100 milliliters. What is T1? 25 degrees Celsius. I have my three, plug them in and go. No, why not? It has to be Kelvin. Has to be Kelvin. Yes? Could you do it at the end? No. Has to be before. Has to be before. Okay. The math, the math will not work out if you don't do it before. Okay. It's the math magic. If you, if you don't do it before, it's going to be wrong. Okay. So we need to convert our Celsius to Kelvin. That conversion is on your cheat sheet. To go from Celsius to Kelvin, you add 273.15. So hopefully you'll remember that going forward, but it is on your cheat sheet. We're going to 25 plus 273.15 equals 298.15 Kelvin. Make sure you convert it to Kelvin. Now we can plug them in. Our two volumes are both milliliters, and so they're good. Because they're the same unit, they're good to go. So we've got 150 divided by 298.15 equals 100 divided by T2. So if you solve for T2, you're going to get 100. And so we put in Kelvin, which we had to, and so we get out Kelvin. Gas law problems are good for checking yourselves. See, does your answer make sense? The question said it was cooled. So hopefully our final temperature is lower than where we started. Is it? Yes. Yes. We started at 298. We ended at 198. 
So we're not guaranteed that we have the right number, but we know we're at least on the right track. We have no reason to believe it is wrong. If it was higher, if temperature had gone up, we know we're wrong. But then we have to convert it back to Celsius because it wants it in Celsius? Yes. So this question says, what it, it's specified. What is the new temperature in degrees Celsius? So So you subtract 273. <coughs> what does that come off to be? Ne negative something. Yeah, negative 74.4 degrees. The steps are written out for that one. I think, I believe what you need to do on, to do the homework is through this slide. So I think we've covered everything you need for the homework. So next week, we're going to start on this slide, finish this one, and then do lecture nine, which is short.